My name is Captain Tyler Rathzak. I'm a developmental engineer in the Air Force, and I've been working at AFRL for three years. At AFRL, I work in the Rocket Propulsion Division, so I currently am supporting the Rotating Detonation Rocket Engine Program. That's kind of a mouthful, right? Rotating Detonation Rocket Engine Program, or we call it the RDRE for short. But if you break it down, it's actually not that complicated. So um, you have the Rotating Detonation and Rocket Engine. So think of the Rocket Engine first, right? Just like a car, rockets have engines that take the chemical energy that's stored in fuel, they burn it, and they transform that into motion. So in a rocket, um, it's a little bit different than a car because in a car, uh, you take your gasoline, you mix it with air, you burn it, right? In a rocket engine, you have your fuel, um, typically something like a kerosene or diesel, and you have liquid oxygen. So it carries its oxygen on board, and that's what allows it to provide propulsion into space. So that's the rocket engine portion. Uh, the middle portion of that title is detonation. So there's two ways a car can burn fuel or an engine can burn fuel. You have deflagration, which is slow, predictable. Um, it's what we use to power everything from like a, a big lighter to a furnace in a house that you know, burns natural gas to car engines and even rocket engines nowadays. The other way that you can react fuel is through a process called detonation. Um, think explosions, really rapid releases of, of pressure, high energy, right? Not something that we typically think of being involved in propulsion. Um, and that's what makes our program so unique. We're trying to leverage detonations to create propulsion. And the last part is rotating. So um, explosions, a big one-time event. It's great if you want to blow up some bad guys. It's not so great if you're trying to put something into orbit. So uh, what we do is we actually have a circular combustion chamber. And when we initiate the initial light off for the engine in one part of the engine, that detonation actually starts to expand in a circle around the perimeter of the engine. And what you end up with is a, a detonation that revolves around the perimeter constantly chasing itself uh, about 30,000 laps per second. And what this does is it provides us with perpetual thrust. So one-time bangs, bad continuous thrust from a rotating detonation, really good. Today we're testing a pretty generic RDRE with the goal of getting some what we call canonical data, um, baseline data that we can compare to our computer simulations. Computer simulations are really powerful. They allow us to look into physics that we can't otherwise measure, but unless we know that our computer simulation matches reality, we can't trust the computer simulation. And so the goal for today, get that data, compare it to the simulation, and make sure our simulations are good. Yeah, my only recommendation today is don't blink. Because this is a prototype engine that has no cooling on it, we're only going to be testing for about one second. That's okay. We know with RDREs, they reach stable combustion within about a couple milliseconds, so the, the one second duration is pr plenty long. I will say this is a, a live experimentation, so really anything could happen. If you see a pretty green flame, it means we're probably burning up our engine. Um, and if you see pieces flying, that means something else went wrong. But that's the fun of experimentation. <laughs> well, thank you. <clears throat> Hello, and welcome to Experimental Cell 1 at AFRL's Rocket Propulsion Division. Today we're going to be doing a demonstration of a rotating detonation rocket engine. The RDRE that we're testing today has a 3-inch diameter, so it's one of our more legacy prototype designs. We're going to be flowing about a half a second uh, a half pound per second of propellant through this engine today, and we expect that to generate about 100 pounds of thrust. We're taking a variety of data measurements, including uh, pressure through the pressure transducers, temperature through thermocouples, as well as two high-speed videos. So inside the annular combustion chamber is where the actual detonation is going to be located, so the flame's going to come shooting out in this direction. One of the cameras back here behind the door is looking perpendicular to that flow field. Um, that's a high-speed color camera. And the second camera is actually located back off scene here, looking directly up the tailpipe. And so with that, we're hoping to be able to see inside the actual combustion chamber and see the individual detonation revolving uh, within that annular chamber. So without further ado, let's head inside and get this test rolling. For the technical details, I'm going to hand you off to the other members of the RDRE team. Hi, I'm Dr. Jason Burr. I'm the experimental lead of the RDRE program. Hi, I'm Dr. John Benowitz, chief engineer of the RDRE team. And I'm Dr. Christopher Leitz, the technical lead for the modeling and simulation portion of the program. Now, if you follow me over here past the monitors, uh, you can see an example of what 
Captain Ransack was referring to outside. Uh, this is a high fidelity simulation. Uh, we run this at Air Force Research Laboratory using CFD, or computational fluid dynamics. Now, CFD software can be pretty expensive computationally to run. Uh, this particular simulation actually took uh, over 10,000 CPUs operating simultaneously for nearly a month in order to actually get. But in the end, we end up with a wealth of data that we can probe to determine what kind of physics is going on and really what the operational characteristics of the engine are. And we can do this with a degree of detail that, at least using current state-of-the-art experimental diagnostics, we've been unable to replicate. Now, if you look at the video in particular, uh, this is a cutaway of the engine that they're about to fire. Uh, there are three detonations inside the engine, and each of them are traveling at approximately two kilometers a second, so very fast. The flow, uh, the fuel and the oxidizer come in from the bottom face there, and almost immediately they get hit by one of the detonations, causing them to react very quickly and driving the pressure up to uh, nearly an order of magnitude above. After that point, uh, they, they eventually kind of, uh, they get forced out the back end of the engine, and that's what generates the thrust. Of course, in a practical device, this whole assembly would be inverted because you want the thrust coming out the bottom. Now, I'll hand it off to, to Dr. John Benowitz, who's going to be uh, telling you a bit more about what the experiment is going to show you. Thank you, Dr. Leitz. So what we're looking at here, this is the high-frequency monitoring station for our various measurements and diagnostics for this hot fire test. So in the middle here, we have the live view taken from the color high-speed camera. You can see the engine uh, shown here. Uh, and what we basically are going to be looking at is uh, the, uh, exit, the exhaust plume uh, of the firing that will be captured at 7,500 frames per second. And in addition to that, you can see we have various high-frequency pressure transducers located about the annulus there. What those allow us to do is capture the oscillatory pressure of the primary operating mode, and we monitor that uh, using the oscilloscope readout shown on the left-hand side here. Uh, and then over here uh, on the right-hand side, uh, this is the live view taken from the downrange camera uh, that's in an armored enclosure that looks directly into the annulus uh, during the firing. That will be imaging at 200,000 frames per second. And what that allows us to do is capture the primary wave dynamics. So the uh, number of waves, how fast they're going, and how stable they are, they tell us a lot about uh, how the engine is behaving. So with that, I believe we're uh, ready to start the main initiation sequence. EC1 will fire in 15 seconds. EC1 will fire in 15 seconds. Okay, so now we're getting to the exciting part. Uh, the propellant, the propellant has been loaded up to the primary fire valves and we're ready for the main initiation sequence. We'll now do the firing and then Dr. Jason Burr will come back and talk to us a bit about the measurements from the test. Three, two, one. So we're back now looking at the data that we just collected from this test. Um, what we're looking at is in the center monitor here, uh, this is the video that was just recorded from that test sequence. So our test time uh, in uh, real units was on the order of three quarters of a second. Um, this playback is one one thousandth frame rate. So we're looking at the qualitative characteristics of the plume to make sure that um, there's nothing that went wrong in the test, that we're not burning some of the hardware. Um, and if there is a problem with the test, we can diagnose it from this high-speed video. Um, some of our high-speed uh, pressure instrumentation that we're looking at on our oscilloscope. Um, we can use that information uh, to later uh, cross-correlate um, as to where the waves are inside of the chamber and um, the number and direction of these waves. Um, but the main uh, imaging that we perform is this high-speed imaging that looks uh, directly up inside of the annular cavity. Um, so here we can see that we have a nice two-wave behavior inside of this uh, test condition. Um, and what we're looking at is the, um, the width and the distribution of this illuminated region, and that tells us something about the, uh, the strength and robustness of the detonation wave, like we saw in Dr. Leitz's um, simulations. Um, and we're also tracking the wave speed in the test. Now, because this is recorded at 200,000 frames per second, um, we're playing it back right now at one ten thousandth that rate. Um, but we have automated image processing where we'll look through the entire test duration to see if there is any change in wave speed or number of waves. Um, it's fairly obvious if you jump to a different time step, but sometimes it might um, quickly snap between different operating modes, and we want to be able to catch that um, and where that is in the data set. Um, so I think with that, we'll, we'll go back to um, Captain Tyler Rathsack, and he's going to uh, have a few more words to say. So, Tyler? 
I'm good here. Uh, not much to close this out. Just want to say thank you very much for joining us today. It's always an absolute pleasure to be able to share some of the fascinating research that we do here at AFRL's Rocket Propulsion Division.